Tonight, I'm very grateful to be moderating this call. My name's Bob Geddes. I'm also a past president. And uh, we're welcoming uh, Alistair Johnson to our call this evening. He's a longtime GHS member, actually number 1300 is his membership number. He's a golf historian, a, uh, an author of some very historical books about golf. And he's also a promoter of uh, the PNC Championship and a member of IMG, a management firm that has uh, been uh, working with very well-known professionals throughout his years. So with that, you've seen some information on the announcement about Alistair, but uh, Alistair, I would like you to maybe talk about those uh, early books that you've written and uh, also touch a little bit about your work with IMG. And then if you could lastly speak a little bit about the PNC championship, which has become very popular among uh, the golfing world, I think that would be a good way to start. And then we'll invite questions on those topics if we can. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Alistair. Okay, well, thank you. Um, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, I've, um, I go way back to the early days of the Golf Galactic Society. Uh, Joe Murdoch uh, was a, a guy that um, uh, fortunately um, tagged on to me very well, gave me a lot of counsel and advice. His grandparents were from Scotland and he was very, he was very much a Scotophile. And um, he was one of, as, as most people know, I think one of the co-founders of the Golf Collector Society. And he was, he inspired me really to, um, to do what I did uh, with respect to trying to collect every golf book, as he said, uh, that ever existed. Um, you know, fast forward to that, my, uh, my collection um, uh, right now, I've, I do a, you know, I do a, a a library of golf um, bibliography every year that I present to USGA and the um, and the RNA and uh, this year's numbers was just over thirty three thousand. Um, so um, it's uh, it's there's a, a few in the background here. All of these books will be going to St Andrews um, as part. I've already donated the entire library as well as a lot of other artifacts within it to the. Um, you know, to, to the library that um, will be uh, hopefully opened in two or three years um, in, uh, in Scotland, then in St. Andrews, and hopefully very close to the, uh, um, you know, the British Golf Museum, um, or the RNA's World Golf Museum, I should say. Um, I'm a member of the RNA, uh, probably um, not something they're proud of, because I probably on a lot of records that most people wouldn't want to have at the RNA. Maybe it's because I always return my scorecard. Um, <laughs> but it get, moves me into the fact that I am not a great golfer. I'm probably um, maybe the worst golfer that's ever played with the best golfers in the world. If I think of the people I've played with and pro-ams and social games, etc. from all the way from Arnold Palmer to Jack Nicholas to Tiger Woods to you, you name them. They've all had to put up with me on the golf course. And I think it's more because I tell good stories. Um, as, 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 one, as one pro said to me at uh, Pebble Beach, uh, also a great story, but we passed your ball about 60 yards back. So go back to that. This leads me into the fact that I'm not really a big expert on golf clubs or golf balls. Um, um, there's a lot of people on this call would certainly be uh, more capable at, um, you know, um, uh, disseminating information on, on, on that subject. I am purely, um, not purely because I have, I've got some nice balls and clubs. I can't deny that. And, you know, a lot of artifacts that I've been given to accentuate the library, but I'm a print. I'm a print guy. It's it's been books. Um, it's been magazines. It's been newspapers, etc. Over the years, and I've um, you know, um, I, I started, you know, essentially collecting because um, I moved, um, you know, to United States in 1972 to come to work for Mark McCormack and IMG, 
um, in, in 72 and 70, uh, we had 26 employees at the time. And in 2000 and early 2000, when Mark passed away, I became the co-CEO and we had 3000 employees. So um, I was fortunate enough, uh, Mark's personal client at the time was Arnold Palmer, and, um, and nobody was allowed to talk to Arnold Palmer until in the, in, at the Masters in 1977, uh, Mark took me for a walk and said, I'd like you to start working with Arnold Palmer. Well, you talk about an immigrant boy that had just, you know, you know that the, I, I was the American dream. Uh, uh, you know, exemplified. I think that the, um, so I started working with Arnold um, in 77 and, um, you know, it took three or four years to, um, you know, to, to get that going. And then I, I did a deal for him with Pennzoil, which he thought was pretty good. And it thought that maybe thought that, you know, my talents actually were worth, um, worth um, collaborating with me on. And, um, and I represented him, I'm proud to say, all the way through to the day he died. And um, I, I was, uh, he had uh, astonishingly given me the privilege of being the trustee on his estate. I was directors of these companies. Um, and as, you know, as he went to the grave before he, you know, we talked about the memorial service that maybe a lot of people saw um, um, that I had to oversee, which was probably the most scary thing I've ever done with respect to ensuring it got done right and inviting the speech or the speakers to attend there. Um, you know, they, and having Jack Nicholas talk about his relationship with Arnold, having Peter Dawson talk about Arnold Palmer being, you know, America's, you know, ambassador for golf around the world, you know, having t talking with Jack Nicholas as his biggest adversary, if you will, but his best friend. Jim Nance looking through the eyes of a camera, etc. So it was something I was a privi uh, privilege to do, and I'm still, you know, working on his estate and still, um, you know, handling a lot of, uh, you know, all his international business and licensing business. So I'm still pretty active there. Um, um, six, uh, six, six years after, um, excuse me, eight years after, uh, up to eight years, uh, uh, coming up to eight years after he passed in September 16th. Um, so that's, you know, that, that, that's my story. Um, everything that I tend to do um, in terms of my collecting, um, you know, it really has a historic tinge to it. And um, it's books that may be very different about golf, but history is a, usually a significant part of it, whether it's, you know, advertising, whether it's uh, instruction, whether it's, as I say, equipment whether it's golf clubs, the golf, the golf clubs themselves, um, and by that I mean societies and clubs and things that we're members of. I'm sitting in my room here um, with my golf club histories around me in this particular room, and I think I've got about 3,700 golf club histories. To me, that is huge. Um, it shows you the great uh, brotherhood, and fraternities, sorority we have now in the game of golf that so many golf clubs have, donated, um, given me uh, copies of their club history, knowing where they're going to end up. And that will be a significant part of my um, of my library once it gets re uh, restarted in St. Andrews. So I think that the, um, you know, at, at this juncture, um, in terms of what we talk about this evening, that's entirely up to, you know, everybody who wants to um, ask a question, make a comment, be abusive. It's all right. I'm very hard. Uh, I'm just don't worry about it. I can take criticism easily. Alistair, uh, maybe before we open it up to some more questions, can you talk about your work with the uh, PNC tournament and uh, how that's grown in popularity and what you're seeing there as the future goes uh, forth? Yeah, I, I, you know, I've been with IMG involved with a lot of that pioneering work. I mean, my, my relationship, um, you know, eventually expanded behind Arnold. And I, I oversee the relationship with the Open Championship, all the media deals for the Open Championship, the, you know, the, the sponsorship, etc. So I was, you know, you know, actively involved behind the scenes in a lot of tournaments, privileged to do it, you know, at the Open, 
um, with IMG in the early years, some of them are, might be old enough to remember things like the Skins game and, you know, Battle of Bighorn and all, all, all these sort of special events that were a big deal in maybe the 80s, 80s and 90s. I was, you know, one of the two or three people that put these all to, these things together. So I was used to, you know, coming up with new, new events. And um, one of the things that um, I, I, I was in... Um, I was in Michigan at a, at a senior tour uh, championship, senior tour PC, TPC championship. And in the locker room, Jack Nichols was on uh, in, in, one co- uh, in one corner. Ray Floyd was in another, Dave Stockton another. And they weren't really caring about what they were doing that day. They were on the phone talking to their kids who were, you know, playing a junior game or, a, you know, a college game or whatever. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if we can do a real tournament? I mean, a real tournament using, you know, real golf courses, big time relationships with respect to um, the the media, you know, coverage, etc. Uh, and and allowing them to play together as a team. So I uh, called my friend, uh, uh, one of our, my, my friends, a guy called Sean McManus, who worked with me at ING, had just gone to head up um, CBS. Uh, sports and I knew he was a big father's thing his father was Jim McKay and uh, he was very into father-son relationships and he said he said oh, sir you know I said I'd love to do it but CBS can't do it at weekends when you want to do it at the end of the year because we got football um, he said but you know NBC our friends at NBC so I called NBC I got you know, I got to know um, a guy called John Miller was had their programming and I said here's my idea we're going to do it um, if you want to come cover it or whatever, um, we're going to make it exclusive. So at that point in time, I basically made it um, clear that if the, fa- the father had to have won a major championship, and it was always fathers at that point in time, Delano basically reminded me that he didn't have any sons or daughters that played golf. So I said, well, oh, grandfathers can play too. So I made up the rules as, uh, you know, as, 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 as I went along. And just to you know, accommodate everybody and 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 make it well done. But I was Tiger's next door neighbor, Iowa, um, when we signed him in 1990. Uh, because I've got to be careful here. He was a professional when we signed him, wasn't he? One day, 1996, and um, and I was next door to him. I played uh, lived next door to him to at the um, which was by the way a house that after we signed him that happened to be available next door to me in Iowa, and. Um, you know, after he won the Masters in 19, uh, in, you know, in 97, you know, he came back the next day or whatever. And I, uh, he was walking by and I said, congratulations. And he goes, well, thanks very much. I said, no, no, it's, I'm not congratulating you on winning the Masters. I'm congratulating you on the fact that you have now qualified for the father-son tournament. And he looked at me like I was a nutcase. So fast forward to three or four years ago, I've stayed in touch with him all the time. I think it's about time to, you know, for me to complete <laughs> my promise to you to invite you to the father, son, get Charlie out here and let's go do it. And uh, that's what happened four years ago. And since since Tiger out, got out there and unfortunately he's had to play with me to his embarrassment in the pro-am several times, but it's been a lot of fun and um and I've been delighted to be able to do it. The whole thing about it is it's got to be family. It's got to relate to, I like good narratives. I write good stories. Um, now I can, you know, I've got father, uh, sons playing with their fathers. I'm hoping to have a son play with their mother um, in this year's event. And obviously the, the sons. I've got girls playing with their sons now. Anna Kassarenstam playing with her son. So I've mixed it, mixed it up to make it, I think, a... Um, you know, a pretty uh, attractive event. And when we, Tiger came out, and this is, I'm not a tech guy, but, you know, I can tell you that um, what they tell me is that we got more hits for that golf tournament when Charlie and, and Tiger came out for the first time than any other golf tournament in the history of the game. Well, it's a... Uh quite successful i know and it's always uh, interesting to see who's going to be uh, competing i i saw a little bit about uh, and how he's uh, played golf with i guess every uh, one of his children in the event who's this uh, bernard longer 
Oh yes, yeah. He's he's played with uh, two of his sons and one and 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 one time with his daughter. He's won it five times with two of his sons. The daughter hasn't yet quite made him a winner, but don't don't count them out at any time. Very good. Well, with that uh, overview, Alistair, I uh, would like to now open it to questions from our uh, group here this evening. And, you know, uh, George, if you can assist me with that, that would be great. Uh, either raise your hand, folks, or if you uh, have entered something in the chat line, we can uh, do it that way. Alistair, this is uh, Jim Jesselnick. Thank you again for helping me find uh, some information about that Bobby Jones book. Mm -hmm. my, my question is uh, related to IMG. Um, who would you say you personally was your most difficult signee? How did you get that person to sign? And um, are, are you still involved in that process or have you kind of handed that off? Yeah, we don't, uh, you know, IMG now is a, um, thanks, John, and happy to help you with that Bobby Jones thing. It was an interesting conversation. Um, the, um, yeah, you know, we are now, IMG, uh, when I was the CEO after Mark uh, passed away, um, we sold the company to a private equity firm, um, and then it was sold on to um, to William Morris um, after that, which is an entertainment um and uh, an entertainment musical and um, you know movie company agency, and um, so since then you know we've become uh, a division of uh, a company called Endeavor, which is a public company. IMG is a company of, of that, and so we are now. Um, and yes, and, I, and to answer your question, I'm still full time there, um, still doing all the things that you know, we've talked about the PNC and other things and. The Arnold Palmer stuff and still very active there but we don't really represent a lot of individuals anymore um that was that that kind of went out I think it really at the end of uh when Tiger came along after that I mean a lot more agents were involved but more importantly uh, um what we could do for them um wasn't just as as the the difference of their revenue levels once prize money went up was that you know we really had to um, pick and choose. We couldn't have you know thirty or forty clients. So we, you know, re representing people as opposed to owning them. Uh, this is the ugly part of the conversation, but it's you know the world of professional sports is really professional today. <laughs> um, so there's um, it's a, it's a very different genre, put it that way. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, let me jump in here uh, with a question. When you wrote your book, uh, The Chronicles of Golf, 1457 to 1857, and it looks like it was published in 1993, uh, you chose the golfers for the cover. I have that uh, print over my shoulder here. It may not be uh, very clear, but I'm just, uh, if you could maybe comment, you obviously had to make that choice for what you wanted on the cover. Can you speak to what went through that decision? Yeah, I think that um, I um, the it was a it was privately printed, it was privately written and published, but you know I had a fairly expensive um, entity that I wanted really wanted. It took me eight years to do with my dad, and I really wanted to do it, uh, you know, a service. And uh, he had he had retired, James Johnston. He had retired, and he had a lot more patience than I did. Um, I, you know, I was tend to the top of my career, just run. If you can, you know, do something for me in the next 10 seconds, I'm moving on, you know, type situation. <laughs> so, but he would go into, you know, he'd go in, 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 born and raised in Scotland. He'd go into old clubs to, you know, ecclesiastical, you know, museums, uh, uh, just libraries. And he used to charm the, you know, the caretakers and the librarians, etc. And as I, I said, um, I've said before, what I wrote the Chronicles for was I was disturbed by the fact that I had um, kept reading on uh, books about history um, of the golf that really didn't 
delve into anything new in most cases. I have to say, since I've written it, there's been some terrific books I've written, mostly by people who are members of this uh, the society or, or, um, or the British Golf Club, the British Golf Club Society or both, and um, who've done some terrific work on it. I think that what I was trying to do was get my dad to go back to the original documentation. You know, if there was bills of lading, you know, with golf clubs coming over from, you know, Scotland to the United States to, you know, Virginia or South Carolina in the 1700s or whatever, you know, see if you can see them, find, find them. Where, where are they? Which museum? All, all that type of stuff. Because I thought that the um, a lot of history books um, were lazy. I think a lot of historians sort of picked up previous history books and basically said, well, the, you know, Mary Queen, Queen of Scots must have, you know, played golf, so we'll start that on page one, which wasn't true, by the way. And then secondly, you know, by the time they get to page four, it's Bobby Jones. And after that, it's 300 pages on everybody else uh, after that. So I didn't think that was quite as authentically. I, I want to do a history that not only, you know, look for real as much as possible, um, real uh, original information, but also told it in a sequence um, that um, may have been interesting to historians of which I was one. You know, I selected the, the dates 1457 to 1857. 1457 was the first, um, uh, the Acts of Parliament in Scotland, uh, which banned golf. Um, and even though they weren't actually printed until 1566, because there was no printing in Scotland un until that time, um, and uh, they were printed in, fortunately, um, I've got a, a copy of that 1566 thing not far from here, um, but the, the it was 1457 when golf was mentioned for the first time when in, in print, um, and um, 1857 was the first time there was a real book on golf done. Um, um, uh, called, called the Golfer's Manual by Farney. I mean, I could show you right now um, the first book on golf. I don't know if you can see that, but that's the golf in 1743. And there's another one, 1793. So I was basically looking for um, information that can put in the context of its time what exactly was going on in the world, you know, when that happened, when the King of Scotland, you know, played at a palace, what was going on in the world? So I tried to do that as, as part of the story of the Chronicles so you could relate to what was going on in history. I mean, I've got a whole piece on American Gov in 1776 when, you know, and all of the things that were going on there who were, you know, who, who were site signatories. There was two Scotsmen that were signatories of the Declaration of Independence. I wanted to talk about them because, you know, they'd come over from Scotland and one of them had been a golfer. And so I was... These early stories I wanted to basically, you know, you know, put into some perspective so that it was, even if you didn't have an interest in golf specifically, you got the trend, you got how old this, you know, sport is, how meaningful it's been in different parts of the world, in India and Australia and Canada and, you know, in addition to the United States and put that, you know, in, 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 in that context. So. Um, that was, you know, that, that was a lot of the, that was a lot of the, the reason I, I did it. It took a, a long time. Um, you know, I might say a couple of marriages. I was going to say, well, maybe just one. <laughs> Very good. I, I see a couple of questions that have come through. George, uh, are you able to uh, see them as well? Someone asked, do you believe that the document, will, will, there will be a document one day that unco that uh, pertains to golf prior to 1457? I don't think so. I think there might be, the, yeah, and, and it will be argued whatever happens, because that debate has been going on for 100 years. And, um, you know, I, 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 yeah, look, a lot of things happen, you know, people get, you know, charged with murder a hundred years later based on DNA tests like situation. <laughs> so I'm not saying that, you know, there won't be the technology that somehow or other will will create uh, something that might be relevant 
But convincing anybody that that is the start of golf or will be the start of golf is, um, you know, I, I think I think makes the, that that scenario particularly unlikely. We have a question from uh, Brent Johnson. He uh, asks uh, or mentions that with such an impressive goal in collecting, uh, he'd like to hear a story or two about some of the books that were the most difficult to come across and how you finally acquired those. And also, uh, what are some of your favorite books in your library, uh, books that you might recommend for an early golf history enthusiast? Well, um, you know, I'm, 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 I am, um, I am biased uh, for a, for a lot of reasons. Um, I mean, I think that the book I just talked about, um, the Chronicles of Golf, um, you know, I, I, with some sense of immodesty, um, I think that would, depending how deep you want to go, but I did that book with my my dad. Um, after he retired, so that was why it was meaningful for me. It won't be meaningful to anybody else if they think that, you know, the, the facts are, are worth, you know, labor, laboring over 743 pages, which probably is a cure for insomnia before it becomes something that's interesting, um, you know, would be, uh, would, would, would be what I would say. I think that, you know, History is the tone of, and I think when you talk about the history of golf, I think you've got to look at different aspects of the history um, and basically focus on them. I think that the, 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 the 4,000 or three and a half, 4,000 books I have on club histories per se, you know, folks, focuses on the growth of the game at grassroots level in different parts of the world. Um, when it gets to the library at St. Andrews, I want to basically have people coming in from all over the world to, you know, from Japan and Italy or whatever, when they're visiting St. Andrews and see club histories from their clubs. So I'm going to have foreign language club histories because golf was something that it wasn't just, you know, you know it just wasn't all took place in Augusta or St. Andrews. So, you know, looking at the history of golf clubs and how people got together with societies and all of that, I think is, one thing, because that certainly um, that, that certainly has um, fueled a lot of the interest. Because a lot of the interest that golf has, as a, you know, as a lifetime sport, is because people play um, for a lifetime, which is unlike most other sports. I mean, you can might be an NFL fan, but you're unlikely to be playing, you know, football, you know, <laughs> into a, a very old age or American football. I call it, but for the purpose of this discussion, I should call it football. And um, the uh, and then in addition to that, you know, the, the book I wrote, uh, Tiger Woods, on um, uh, the, the uh, illustrated history of golf from Varden to Woods, you know, was where golfers were used in advertising, and I think that was part of the culture of uh, of the of, of the country. Um, you know, you know, the culture was everybody smoked back then. Almost every golfer, every golfer, and you know, basically smoked or advertised cigarettes and every you know although going way back to harry barton tobacco and cigarette there's history there there's history in terms of instruction you know you can get books on, on instruction why they're different you can sure get a lot of books on on the history of golf clubs and golf equipment and balls etc so i think that you know yeah, yeah, in terms of the championships yeah, I think it's important. I mean, I think that there's great books. I mean, there's very good books on, on the Masters. It's the most recent, you know, major championship. And uh, so it only goes back to, you know, 34, 35. So, you know, I, I, but I, I, I'm interested in history at, at any level. For example, when somebody asked me who won the Open Championship in 1940, in 1948 or whatever, you know, I, I don't like... I have, and one of the things I've collected is the draw sheets from these tournaments because they actually, the draw sheets, you know, that went with the program, if there was a program or whatever, they are in real time, you know, the, the most, um, you know, independent, you know, the, the most, um, the most accurate and um, the accurate source of, who played what and where, you know, did Sam Snead actually play in more championships, but he 
played in the Monday qual qualifying and didn't actually appear in the championship itself, but the playing sheet would tell you type situation. So um, now the RNA, you know, with uh, uh, my encouragement, you know, are keeping records now of what exactly the players in the championship are saying at their media pre media conferences, just to the point, and they've been keeping it now for a while. What these players were saying in real time. I love history that's written in real time that can be, um, you know, can, you know, can be enjoyed and uh, dissected, if you will, later on. I could go on and on in different elements of it, but kind of just the history of golf. Pick, pick something a little bit more specific. And you'll have more fun doing it. There was a question about, a little controversial, but PGA versus Liv. Specific question by um, Jeff said, you know, how are the guys who stuck it through with the PGA feel? And, and maybe that relates a little. How does this relate to um, in the late 60s when Gardner Dickinson and Jack and then eventually Arnery kind of, they separated, you know, the PGA Tour from the PGA of America. A lot of controversy back then, too. So this maybe is there a little bit of a parallel there or, you know, what are your what are your thoughts about the what happened in the 60s and maybe what's happening now? With live. Well, I think there is uh, parallels, but there's there's certainly bigger distinctions that probably are the ones that are most not not noteworthy. Um, first of all, full disclosure: Jay uh, Monahan, the commissioner, um, not only has been a good friend of mine for a long time, he used to work for me. Um, uh, he reported to me. He used to work for IMG, so I I've, I've been pretty close. He's been he and his son and his father have been guess the father son uh whatever so i've known jay, jay for a while um um and but but obviously you know in the in the in the real world uh today um i think that the there is i i i well let me say this to you arnold palmer's son um uh, excuse me grandson because back when when the love thing started you know, moving around um, early on, and there was some debate uh, back a year and a half ago or whatever, a lot of people would say, or I've saw it written in the press, you know, well, what would Arnie do? What would Arnold do? And his grandson um, called me, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm, he's one of the, my trustee, uh, you know, people I tr trust over, so I communicate with him a lot. I said, I tell you what, I'll write you a letter, like you're Arnold, you're your grandfather just like I would have if he'd been there. And here's what I would suggest he did. And I wrote that in the form of me writing it to Arnold. And the things, you know, the, the, the things I wrote at that, point in t at that point in time, I showed to a few of my friends. Some of them have been pretty prescient. The others, have, you know, haven't, haven't been particularly relevant. But, you know, one of the things that I, um, I did emphasize is that it was just going to be a matter of time before the PGA Tour were threatened. They had tried to do something, and I think Tim Fincham was probably most responsible. And by the way, Tim was a good friend of mine as well, so I'm not being critical of him, but, you know, everybody takes their opportunity at the time. You know, he once said to me, you know, we were out in China together. He said, also, I want the PGA Tour logo to be the most recognizable, you know, mark in all of golf. And I want it to be... Uh, I want that mark to be, uh, you know, basically ultimately regarded as something that is indicative of the highest class, the highest, you know, the, 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 the best players in the game, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that was, you know, it was, a, a, it was an unreasonable expectation because um, they did, they, the, the PGA Tour at that point in time basically thought that, you know, they would um, underwrite local golf leagues. Um, they, 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 they wrote under low things in China and, you know, in Canada and whatever. And, and they were really for, um, for basically um, to jump into the PGA Tour, qualify for the PGA Tour. I mean, great, great for the PGA Tour. So the best players in the world would come to America and play there. And that worked for a while. But what you what you left it was you were leaving with a um, a void of golf actually being played at the highest level in different countries of the world, and I think that it was just a matter of time before. And I basically said this to Will Arnold's grandson. 
The PGA Tour can't be all things to everybody in the United States every week of 52 weeks. There's got to be some sort of concession that the, the, the rest of the world is going to play golf somewhere and it's not all going to be beholden to come and play on a, you know, a, 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 pre, a, a preliminary tour um, you know, in the, before you get to the PGA Tour and everything in the world of professional golf. Um, you know, would center around Ponte Vida. That's not going to happen. So get into the discussion. Go ahead of it. Now, the personalities back at that time were not great a couple of years ago. Uh, Greg Norman wasn't, isn't particularly liked, um, you know, at the PGA Tour. Nothing, you know, no, no, no surprise there. And so there was a lot of personal issues at that, uh, you know, at, at that point in time. But I basically said, play, embrace whoever is wanting to do something. Don't knock them back. Embrace them first. Embrace them in conversation. Um, but don't challenge them. And I think that's one of the, the mistakes that was made, that the PGA Tour were too quick to challenge. And basically, not only challenge, but to threaten um, you know, the other parties. And, you know, notwithstanding all of the ugly things that, you know, that are certainly justifiably being leveled against Saudis, et cetera, I think that the, um, you know, they had to be taken seriously because of the amount of, there was a lot of precedent for that, for, for that. They had to, you know, be taken seriously. And I think they didn't take them seriously enough. I don't think that they, um, and I think that what has happened now, it's opened up, um, a diverse of um, atmosphere that will take some time to calm down. But once the tour get tours get themselves settled, you know the next generation of players or the, the next players coming up, you know, won't be harrying the harboring. Uh, excuse me, har demonstrating the same um, harboring, the the jealousy or resentment of their colleagues going across and, 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 and making all this money. So it, it will go away eventually. Where I wonder, however, is, you know, about the partners that P, the PGA Tour are, um, are basically engaging with right now. I think that the group of, you know, billionaire um, team owners um, that the, the, the strategic alliance, um, I think these guys expect a return on their money. And how they are going to invest in this and get money back out of this or return on in what form and where is going to be a big factor that you know you can't ignore. You, know, you can't take one and a half billion of their money or whatever and not give them the opportunity or at least the but you know the um uh, the sense that it exists in some form or other and an, a return on investment will, um, you know, will sooner or later, um, you know, uh, arise. Uh, these guys, have, you know, are owning major football teams, soft, uh, you know, baseball teams or whatever. Um, and I think that the, um, they're used to cash flow. They're used to selling for a lot more than they bought it for, et cetera. Um, their mindset, their business models have been very successful. They're very smart people. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to be addressed. And I think that's candidly one of the things that, as we speak, are being wrestled with. Alistair, uh, Bob Geddes here again. Uh, we have a, a comment from our immediate past president, Bern Bernanke. You mentioned uh, Mr. Palmer's grandson. And he wants to just thank you for being the person that worked with Arnold Palmer, uh, you know, so closely for his uh, career and his life. And can you please comment on Arnold's commitment to youth and development of the game? Well, I think that, you know, I think it was the youth and, and, and development um, was, um, was manifested in a lot of different ways. Um, I think that, um, and, and, and in some ways it was focused on people that were, you know, young kids that didn't have a chance, um, really. Um, the, the charities he got involved with, you know, from his own hospital, 
um, and um, you know from from the others when he was the um, spokespersons for various charities that you know that promoted golf with disabled kids and etc. You know it was it was pretty high high profile at the time. Um, you know, and this was back in the sixties, and um, you know, and I think that the um, but where he is contributing today, I think, is you know starting the the Palmer Cup um, for you know college golfers and college golfers America versus the rest of the world, and not only doing that, but you know under his you know watch to make sure that it was girls and guys and from all over the world, et cetera. I think the Arnold Park Palmer Cup and, you know, that that he did that initially in conjunction with the Golf Coaches Association. Um, and I think that was something that he really, really in, in, enjoyed. I'd been with him at a couple of dinners of the, the, the Palmer Cup. It, he used to call it the Palmer Cup. I had him change it to the Arnold Palmer Cup because I thought it would be more appropriate. But I remember, you know, people you know, at dinners and, players like John Ram and many, many others, um, you know, walking through the dining room to come and thank Mr. Palmer for, you know, when they were college kids. So a lot of the players out there, you know, that, have, you know, have gone on to win major championships played through the Arnold Palmer Cup. And I think it, I think, I think in many ways that was the top end of the, of the scale. These were the kids that felt they had a chance of turning pro and, um, and I think he gave them a perfect vehicle to, you know, to help that transition in the Arnold Palmer Cup. And uh, we have a couple of Arnie's amigos, of course, on the phone uh, tonight, uh, including John Rusposin. He mentions uh, about the wonderful uh, Palmer Memorial at St. Vincent College. Does that uh, give you enough information, uh, Alistair, to comment? Oh yeah, that's what I was talking about um, earlier. His memorial service um, was something that um, I uh, I knew that um, I uh, had to do, and IMG were terrific in terms of providing a lot of protocol. Um, excuse me, um, a lot of support um, to the um, uh, to the um, occasion. Uh, but there was an amazing amount of help. Um, you know, the Golf Channel jumped in. The Coast Guard wanted to help out. You know, I got um, Vince Gill to come, one of Arnold's favorite guys in the entertainment business to come. Um, and um, one of the, um, you know, things that I said earlier, I like getting all the speakers, not one guy that I, or girl that I asked to do the, the, the you know, speak there um, was, um, you know, said no. They, and they all basically said, every one of them, whether it was Jack Nicholas or Jim Nance saying, this is the most nervous I've ever been, you know, but speaking, <laughs> speaking at that service on that day, they were really, really nervous because they knew the world was watching. Everybody was there. At, at the, we, we didn't know how, how, how many the uh, St. Vincent would hold. It was 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. You know, we had all sorts of the, the irony of it was it was just before the last election, the 2016 election, and um, John, Donald Trump had planned on coming to that area at that particular point in time. And we had no idea already how much, how much you know, law enforcement they, we would need to close roads or whatever with three or 4,000 people descending. So it was for five or six days, it was kind of harrowing with respect to the planning for it. But I think that the thing that I, I um, really, really um, was, was proud of is that I got Russ Meyer, who was his old friend, who was a chairman of Cessna, um, or, um, who basically had worked with him on his airplanes all the time. I said, you know, we, we talked about getting the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds to come over and Arnold's flew in with both of them and great relationship with them. But I said, why don't we just have his own airplane do the, uh, the flyover at the end? And, and I basically said to Russ, I said, how, how fast can a Cessna Citation 10 turn up and go straight up? So we got into all the stuff that I had no idea about, but I envisaged what it, what it would be like. And boy, was, were people listening because out there in Latrobe that day, that airplane came in and it went straight up there. 
and it went straight up there in a blue sky and disappeared into the one white cloud that you you could see. Um, a, a very memorable occasion. I know a lot of Arnold's friends were there, and many, many of them in this call. Um, it was it was a, a huge honor for me to you know be have the role I did there, and um, the, the number of people that I, I, I couldn't thank them enough from the arts, you know, you know, from Douglas Nowicki. <laughs> um, um, the Arch Abbot, um, all of them were, were, were terrific. It was a, a great day for for golf. It was a great day for the community. It was a great day for, um, I think, an appreciation for somebody that would have been really delighted with what happened. I hope he would have been away. Yes, and uh, I just want to make a, a correction to what I said earlier. I think I had you as the 1300th 1300th member of the GCS, uh, Alistair, someone corrected me. I think you were the 479th member. So <laughs> I want to make sure the record's straight on that. And uh, there's a question about, uh, I believe, Mr. Palmer's experience at the PGA tournament. Uh, I'm wondering if he ever commented on not meeting the PGA requirement to play in the PGA championship for the first several years, he was on tour 1955 to 57, at least, especially since he never won that major. Did he ever speak to you about that, Alistair? Oh yeah. I mean, that was, that, that, that was, you know, that, the, that was the, the rules of, uh, that was, you know, he couldn't play in the Ryder cup for several years because of the PGA Americas. They had some very strict rules at that point in time with respect to participation in their events. And um, they, they had some, you know, around about the same time, you know, some ugly rules that they got changed with respect to restricting, you know, you know not, 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 not allowing minorities to play. The PGA were going through at that point in time. Um, I don't think it was a great, uh, the greatest era of its history. They certainly got it corrected and corrected quick and they're a great organization today. Um, but I think, yeah, he certainly regrets, you know, not winning the PGA Championship. You know, when he won the senior PGA, that wasn't, that wasn't going to make up for it. But look, at the end of the day, he didn't win it. It wasn't the PGA's fault that he didn't win the, the PGA Championship. He might not have had the opportunity to play in PGA events as much as he would have liked to in the early days, as you pointed out. But, you know, he takes full responsibility for not, for, uh, for not winning it. Yeah, and we talked about it a lot. We, we, we had a lot of uh, kettle ones late at night. <laughs> Alistair, uh, maybe a, a bit of a selfish question, but many of the people on this call have had the opportunity to visit Latrobe and to see the uh, amassed collection of Mr. Palmer in the uh, large uh, facility out there. And you mentioned that you're still managing the estate. Can you give us a hint perhaps of when some of those collectibles might be available to the uh, collecting public? Well, I think that I, 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 I don't have to give you a, a hint. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, factually, um, you know, as part of my role as a co-trustee on his estate, along with his attorney, um, uh, state planning attorney, you know, we actually owned legally all these assets um, and um, and had to funnel it through a trustee system that he'd set up. Um, so all, all of these assets, but we had a um, we had an agreement amongst all of the beneficiaries, uh, as well as the you know the myself and our trustee that all of the memorabilia would go to On His Army Charitable Foundation. And the Charitable Foundation basically would own all of his artifacts. We, we, we tried to sort of restrict it by, you know, cost like everything over 5,000 would go there and everything under 5,000 would, you know, go there or whatever. It, it just wasn't practical. I mean, first of all, that wasn't the point. I mean, nobody was using... Um, you know, money bifur bifurcation rationale. Um, it was all it was something with, with, with Arnold, and uh, you know, we and we obviously had to have it um, valued and uh, go go through the whole protocol um, as you do in situations like that. But um, 
So what has happened is the um, there is the, the showing of the of the of the artifacts. You know, we intended going to be mob mobilized, um, but also a lot of it went to Bay Hill um, and to be you know exhibited during the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, today I, I don't have anything involved. I, I'm not involved with the Army uh, Army Foundation, and one of the last things that we did. Um, was we actually transferred La Trobe Country Club itself into the Arnie and Winnie Palmer Foundation. So it is now owned by the Charitable Foundation, the La Trobe Country Club itself. Okay, Bill, uh, why don't you jump in? Yes, yeah, sure, Alistair, how are you? Uh, thanks so much. I just wanted to know with all the history you've been talking about and the, the live and the PGA, what do you feel the mindset of the younger players on the tour is today relative to the uh, history of the game? And do you think they share the same linkage to the past that some of the players in the uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s did? I think that's a bigger question, Bill. I, I think it's um, – I, I, I look at it through my own kids here. Um, it, it's a definitely a different generation, um, I think, but, geez – Every generation has been a different generation. This is just one we just have to experience with. Um, I think that the um, I think that the people that play golf, however, um, generally speaking, um, have held to have held to the traditions and, um, if you will, the you know the the practices of um, of golfers. You know the you know, keeping your own score, all, all of the different things, uh, calling your penalty shots on yourself, etc. I don't see that changing. I think so. In terms of their, um, you know, I think that the beauty of the game and the 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 elements of the game, the pressure of the game, the competition of the game means that res respecting these, you know, the, the, these principles, I think, are a part of it. So. I don't. I don't see any indication that people coming into the game to play it at the professional level are are doing anything else but respecting the game. Yeah, do they you know that the rules are you know are the breaking the rules or having a rule go against you is probably costing them a lot more money. But I don't see any indication at this point in time that the people coming into the game are not respecting the game as much. You know, being kids and you know being you know having uh, you know having uh, their buddies or people that are their, you know, same same age doing the same thing in other sports, if you will. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's that's something that yeah they they look at until they realize, just like their predecessors did. You know, the average age of uh, the average number of years a professional football player plays in the NFL is three years, and um, the um, the average that they could play in their professional game could be 30 years, 40 years, whatever. So in terms of the, the, the dollar for dollar comparison at this point in time, it is ameliorated to some extent by the fact that their careers, you know, in golf, you know, can still be a 30, 40 year career. There's nothing I, 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 I there's nothing that's going on with any of the changes that are rumored or speculated upon that is going to change that. If you can keep up your playing the game, if you commit to it, if you put the time into it, you're going to be better. Uh, so the basics, I think, are going to be what uh, makes sure that the game is surviving. Keep in mind, as we, as, as I think most of us know, that you know, when there was a huge uplift in players during the COVID crisis um, in terms of people who played, you know, played golf. And I think I, I think that carried on to, you know, in terms of participation levels since COVID has been significant. And I think that at, at, at the end of the day, um, I think the game of golf, per se, you know, is in a, is in a pretty healthy position. Um, as long as it doesn't get too reliant on other industries, which it did for a while when it relied not so much on, um, on golf, but on real estate. And, you know, I had large golf courses and expensive golf courses that, you know, um, you know, were out of sync with respect to, 
you know, what people actually wanted, you know, from a game as opposed to a lifestyle. So all, all of that. But I, 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 I don't see any indication that the kids coming up today are not respecting the game with the same aspiration. And I think that, you know, as long as the major championships are around, um, I think that, you know, that that is the best way that they have today of keeping score. Whether that'll be the same place 10 years from now, I'm not so sure. Related to that, Alistair, uh, Bern Bernanke, again, our immediate past president, wants me to mention that, uh, of course, with Mr. Palmer, that his greatest trophy is in Pittsburgh, the core of the first T Pittsburgh or APLC, the Arnold Palmer Learning Center. So uh, I think that uh, mission that Mr. Palmer had, had uh, continues with, uh, with that learning center in Pittsburgh. Right. Absolutely. That's one of them for sure. And that, and, and the ones, I don't have to say this for the benefit of a lot of the guys on here who I know, um, you know, he, he, he lived in La Trobe because he wanted to live in La Trobe, not because he couldn't live anywhere else or, or didn't. And he always went back there. That's where I always felt him, you know, I felt he was at, great, at the greatest comfort. We had a, a question from James Kaiser. He'd like you to uh, maybe touch on a different subject. What do you think of the uh, Top Golf Company? Yeah, well, the Top Golf Company um, is now the Callaway Company, and um, and they've done very well. And I think it has done. I, I think the very fact is sort of like imitation or um, copying or whatever is the biggest sense of uh, is the biggest compliment you have. Everybody is trying to uh, right now try and figure out how to out top golf, top golf with different ways, you know, of, of, of doing it. But I think that I think they've been uh, a well-run organization. I think they've operated well. I think um, I, I I knew it and experienced it in the early days when I first came here. They did some stuff with IMG, but I think it was a very smart move by. Uh, by Callaway to acquire it, and you know I don't know much about their uh, their their bottom line and their revenue models and costs. That's all for other people to know, but um, I think it's doing well for them. I just uh, you know I I I can't help but um, you know just have some memories of of Arnold. And I'll tell you one before um, um, before we go off, um, and it took place when we were mentioning La Trobe. Many, many nights, I had great nights with Arnold at La Trobe, staying at his house and having a few kettles, kettle ones, and with Winnie cooking dinner and whatever. And for those that know Arnold, one of the things he, you know, sometimes he was malapropisms, if you know why. He didn't use the right word at times or the spelling. Like, for example, he used to say, well, I'm going to leave in my helicopter and i'd say arnold there's no f in helicopter you know types of <laughs> helicopter and, and he used to call andy bean andy beam and you know it was, it was just things like that he never at times he never quite got the um you know, never quite got the right words at time which was and he didn't really <laughs> appreciate it really in fact if you kind of chastise him for it you got pissed off so, <laughs> and, so one night, one night, you know what i'm talking about so one night we're sitting there in La Trobe, we're having a couple of drinks, and he says to me, he says, you know, you know, I know how to do deal with you. I said, you know, what? He says, I know how to deal with Scotsmen. I said, okay, so how do you do? He said, look, when I was growing up in La Trobe, you know, in the Depression, you know, my, my dad was the greenskeeper, and the, uh, the pro was a Scottish guy, and he had a son that was in my same age, and we all lived in the same cottage together, you know, back in the early, you know, 30s and, uh, you know, 40, uh, you know, whatever. And um, he said, so I had to deal with a damn young Scott, you know, playing, you know, with me. And I, I know all about it. And then he goes, in fact, he says, I'm Scottish. And I said, what? And he said, I'm Scottish. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? I mean, you, he said, I've got Scottish in me. I said, I'm not, no, you don't. And at this point in time, he goes, yeah, I do. <laughs> and he said, no, no, you're uh, from, uh, 
you're from Western Pennsylvania, the bombers, it's German or whatever. Oh, I wish you were Scottish, but you're not. He says, I am Scots. <laughs> and, you know, and now it's like slamming his finger. He says, I am Scottish. And don't argue with me. I've had it all checked out. It's all in a big book up on my desk. It's in my gynecology. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, you, you didn't mean genealogy, did you? <laughs> <laughs> By this time, Winnie had fallen over, was, you know, flat out laughing our head off. It was like, oh, God. And he's still, till this day, I'm still sure, not sure why, why we were both cats <laughs> by a rap. Oh. Anyway, that's, that's my closing story. Oh. <laughs> and I see uh, Dr. Truitt has joined us. Yeah, Philip <laughs> Truitt. And I'm an hour late. Can well, you hear me? Okay. We're glad to hear can, you, Philip, and see you. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes. I was led to believe you were five hours uh, behind us, so hence my staying up until one o'clock in the morning <laughs> uh, to hear one of my great heroes or the, my great hero, and I've missed an hour of it. Well, uh, Philip, it's four hours, and you should have known better. Well, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you, you've got to you, 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 look out. You've got to look at what's not happening in Sussex, England. I know you're very smart about all that, but America well, actually, actually pushed its uh, its clocks back two weeks ago, and you missed it. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's sorry, by the way, not Sussex. Okay, and by the way, it's uh, but, yeah, you, they pushed their clocks forward, so I correct myself as well. Yeah. Now, well when Philip, I it's, Google it's nice it, of you to. Nice of you to join us, and uh, we'll certainly make sure that you get a link to the uh, to the Zoom call this evening. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, Philip. Thank sorry, you to, for sorry, to miss, sorry to miss. Sorry to miss. Uh, sorry to miss you, Alistair. Sleep well. No, Happy dreams. Fine. Happy dreams. One of, one of our <laughs> most recent. One of our most recent Hall of Famers is going to bed. I don't blame him. Yeah. Thank you. Tell, tell the world about it. Cheerio, everybody. This is going, this is going back into the video. He's, reins, he's reinserted now. Uh, that's wonderful. John. Well, be, be, careful, be careful where you put it in the tape. Don't put it right at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I want to express my gratitude to uh, Alistair Johnson for being with us tonight and certainly the uh, all the folks that were on the call again Alistair it's been a pleasure thank you so much okay thanks guys appreciate it good night thank you.